I hope everybody's doing well. We finished our series on Elisha uh, last week, and so we get to go to Jonah. Maybe we need a little prompt. No, I'm kidding, right? I don't know if you need some music to kind of get you going or like, right. so we get to go to Jonah and it's funny because as I've mentioned Jonah, so many people, oh, I'm so excited that we get to go to Jonah, that we get to dive into Jonah and I never knew this, there was this kind of excitement about Jonah, but I guess it makes sense, right, because um, probably one of the best known stories of the Old Testament, right, the whale, Right, and Jonah's in the whale, and everything's nice and sweet. He's cooking a nice fire. He's roasting some hot dogs. We don't know where he got those, but he's in there with the seaweed. And it's funny because you look at all the story Bibles, and like Jonah's got this smile on his face, and he's in the belly of a whale, and it just everything just seems like. And that's the opposite. It would be like he's in there with the stomach acids, right? And 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 how he is surviving in the in in the belly of a of a fish is. How, uh, we don't even know how that even happens. And then he gets vomited up onto a beach. I mean, we really kind of clean it up for the kids, but it's really quite a, a, a gruesome and just really interesting story, right? But I think it's because there's so many reasons. I mean, it's probably because of that, right? I mean, that's some of the fascination with Jonah is, is because, you know, we learn it as a kid or we see it in the story Bible or something like that or, or just the fact that, that this is an odd guy who tells God no. Anybody thought of that? This guy just tells God no right off the bat. No, not going to do it. Not going to go where you want me to go. Not going to listen to you. I'm out, right? And we're about to to discover that. So, and and the other thing about it is, like, we have no context of Jonah prior to or after. That's the other thing about this book. It's like we dive right in and almost like mid-action. It's like mid, kind of mid-sentence, and it just starts, boom. And we start to, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, go to Nineveh. And this, you know, but there's no like, there's no setup or anything like that. And then at the end, if you at, at the end of chapter four, boom, it's like, wait a second. Okay, Nineveh was spared. Jonah did what the Lord wanted him to do. Eventually, after he went through the discipline of the Lord, right, and all that, and then boom, all of a sudden, okay, so what happens next? What happened to Nineveh, right? How did how did that get resolved? Like we just, there's so many things that are so odd, weird, and unresolved about this story. Uh, yet there's so much that we can identify with. So go ahead and turn to Jonah 1. That is going to be in the Old Testament. And that's going to be one of the, he's considered one of the minor prophets. So he's in one of those little small books that you can thumb through really quick. And and so if you don't get, if you don't uh, get it really close there, you'll, you'll thumb right, you'll thumb right past it. Okay. So Jonah right there. On my page, it's page number 1687, if anybody has the ESV study Bible that looks like this. For everybody else, it's page number whatever for you. I don't know which one it is for you, but 1687 uh, for me, and it is um, right after Obadiah and right before Micah. So if you get to Micah, you're too far, so go back a few pages, and it is four short chapters, so there's not much there. Y'all remember, um, I think it was like about a week and a half ago that we had an escaped convict, a fugitive on the run um, out in the garrison area. Y'all remember that? It kind of hit the news and was all over. Brian's like, yeah, it was in my backyard. Yeah, yeah it was closer, somewhere around there. So uh, but, but particularly garrison folks were kind of really like on alert because this guy somewhere, uh, I think it may have been around the Atoyak. Y'all maybe can correct me on that. But there was, it was about in that area there that he... He had escaped, um, and he was in the woods, or he was somewhere like that. And it was also um, that night when there was rain, and it was it was dark, and like okay, and everybody's wondering how in the world is the search team like going to find him? How in the world is law enforcement going to find this guy? And they they eventually do find the guy, but he the guy was was on the run, and it made me think about <laughs> it made me think about Jonah being on the run. Just, just, he's on the run from God. And um, how many of you know that you and I are no match for the God of the universe to be on the run from him, right? Yeah, we, we did. it's futile. But we try, don't we? Yet we try. Yet in our humanity, we think, I can hide from the Lord. 
I'm just going to hide over here, just kind of hang out, camp out, and just kind of be hidden from him. And we discover that there is no way that that can happen. Let's dive in. Jonah chapter 1, verse 1. Here it is. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose and fled to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Now first, right off the bat, off the bat you need to know that Nineveh is part of the great Assyrian kingdom. Nineveh would be 500 to 600 miles from where uh, Jonah currently is in Israel. So it's a good trek. It's a port city up north, okay? And, and, and it is um, hustling, bustling, millions of people in this town, in this great city. And they're part of the Assyrian kingdom. Now, what you need to know about the Assyrians, if we've read, uh, which we have been reading about uh, in 2 Kings, we see, that we, we see the Assyrians uh, that come against, many times are coming against Israel. And here's what you need to know about the Assyrians. They are a mean, mean people. They string people up. They do awful things that I'm not going to mention right now. But let's just say it's past R-rated of what they do to their enemies, okay? It's awful, awful stuff, so you need to know that. That's the city, the great city of Nineveh, the kind of of, of folks that we're talking about and what they do to their enemies, um, those that they uh, capture and conquer. And so arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up to me. You can write this down. This might seem odd in light of the two verses that we just read, but you can write this down. Here is the message that God is wanting to convey to Jonah for him to convey to the people of Nineveh. You can write it down. God loves all people. You say, that's not, that's, I didn't quite get that in verse 1 and 2. Well, hang on. Hang on, we're going, to get, we're going to get some more context. But God loves all people. I just told you how bad the Ninevites were. Just told you how bad the, Assyri- uh, the Assyrians were. But listen, God is trying and is calling these awful people, these people who, by the way, are the direct enemy of Israel, okay? They come against Israel repeatedly, okay? And so you can understand a little bit more here how Jonah, it's basically like, hey, God says, hey, Jonah. I want you to get up. I want you to go to the people that you hate the most. And I want you to call them to turn from their wicked ways. A little more idea of why Jonah says, no, thank you, Lord. I don't think I want to take the 600-mile trip to go preach your love, your long-suffering towards them. But that's exactly what God's calling him to do. See, God loves people, listen, across all races, all social status, and all classes. Look, you can read this from beginning to end, and you will never find a case for racism. You'll find the exact opposite. You can read this from beginning to end, and what you see is God's heart for all people, regardless of how much money they make or how little they make, regardless of what zip code they live in, regardless of where they live He loves all people because we look at phrases. By the way, did you know that the gospel is the most inclusive and the most exclusive at the same time? Did you know that? Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Whoever, that's everybody, calls upon the name of the Lord, that's inclusive and exclusive, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever, right? But what must they do? Believe. And to me, the very best example of the inclusive nature and the exclusive nature of the gospel is John 14, 6, where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. And right before that, he says, come, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. See, multiple times we can see that in the very same verse, we see the inclusivity of Jesus inviting all to come, but the exclusivity that he is the only one that you will find life forgiveness in. Amen? And so Jonah knows this. Jonah knows who God is, knows his character. And catch this, it's because Jonah knows God, 
in that way in terms of being a compassionate God that he does not want to do what God wants him to do. You ever been there? You're like, look, I don't want to forgive that person. I know God's already forgiven that person. I don't want to forgive that person, right? Because they hurt me or they hurt my people. They hurt my family. I don't want to do that. And God, God says, hey, I want you to get up and I want you to go over there and I want you to show them my love. So God is calling Jonah to go to his country's biggest enemy and preach repentance and the love of God. By the way, in a very practical sense, think about this. This is the enemy army that comes against Israel repeatedly, and God is saying, hey, I'm going to give you a chance to repent. And think about it in Jonah's mind. Oh, yeah, so they can just come kill us in just a few months. Just in the very practical nature. I want you to understand before we just dismiss Jonah as being like, oh, gosh, this guy is awful, right? Right? But this shouldn't surprise us. This is who God is. Go to Exodus 34, everybody. Let's take a little Bible march back to the Old Testament. Well, we're already in the Old Testament, but go back a few. Exodus 34, second book of the Bible. Shouldn't surprise us. This is who God is. Let's remember how the Lord has revealed himself repeatedly to a rebellious people. Exodus 34. Verse 5, the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. Here's verse 6, the Lord passed before him, that's Moses, and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and forgiveness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, the children's children, to the third and the fourth generation. <clears throat> you say, okay, that sounds great. Well, let me tell you, there's something significant happening here. The Lord is revealing himself to Moses on the top of Mount Sinai. Now, to get the full context of this, I want you to go, you say, well, what's going on? Where are we in the life of Israel and, the, and his people? And why has, why has Moses gone up to the mount? Go one page back. Go one page back. And you should see right there in Exodus 32, the story of the golden calf. Anybody ever holding the, heard of the golden calf? The golden calf was where they took all their jewelry that the Lord had allowed them to take from Israel. They threw it into the fire. Aaron says, hey, Leah, let's go ahead and do this, right? That's Aaron is Moses' brother. And they go ahead and proceed to make an idol because Moses is up on Mount Sinai the first time receiving the law of the Lord, and he is taking too long. Anybody think that God takes too long sometimes? Anybody get impatient with God? <sighs> Would you just hurry up and get this person to repentance? I mean, goodness, how long is it going to take, right? I mean, we are an impatient people. These Israelites are impatient. They want to know, where has Moses gone? And he goes, and then it says that he's up on the mountain, and it says that Moses... He hears something and God says, well, you, you better get back down there because let me tell you what's going on. Your brother Aaron <laughs> is leading the people and they're worshiping a golden calf right now. Moses comes down. He's so angry. He breaks the, he throws the tablets down, breaks the tablets. And you would think that at this point in the story, this is it. God's going to smite them. He's going to smoke them and burn them up. No. God says, Moses... Come back up the mountain. Come back up again. Same place. Same, same spot, same area. But get the, guess, guess what? God chooses to reveal himself in Exodus 34. He's going to reveal himself even more. See, I think there comes a moment that you have to realize the weight of your sin in the depths of his grace. The weight of your sin in the depths of his grace. When you realize what you have been forgiven from, his grace is sweeter, is it not? I'll say that one more time. 
When you realize what he has rescued you from, how he has saved you from yourself and your kingdom of self, and he has delivered you from that, his grace is even sweeter. Amen? This is a sweeter time with the Lord when Moses goes back up. Oh, yeah, he went through the, the motion of anger. He was very frustrated with his brother, frustrated with his people, frustrated. And he goes up there, and God says, listen, listen. I'm not going to choose to be frustrated with you and my people. I am going to use this as an opportunity to reveal to you what my character is, who I am. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Many of us don't remember that that great declaration, I call it the John 3.16 of the Old Testament, where God reveals himself really for the first time in this way. And he says, what? He says, I'm slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. We forget that that was on the heels of the golden calf, but it was. And so we see this repeated, this, this Exodus 34, 6, that the Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. How many of you know that um, we as humans tend to forget things? Anybody forget where they place their keys sometimes? Hey, my favorite how about you forget where your sunglasses are? Up on the top of the head? Even better, where's my sunglasses and you're wearing them? That's, hap I've seen, uh, that's happened before too, right? But we forget things. We lose things. Do you know it's the same thing with we forget who God is? Can I tell you one of the reasons that we come back together week after week after week after week? It's, it's not just because we're creatures of habit. We come back together and gather in the name of Jesus so we can remind ourselves who Jesus is right? And so that we, the body of Christ, the family of Jesus, can say, yes, this is who he is. Let's sing about who he is. Let's read about who he is. Let's encourage one another. Let's preach about who he is. Let's teach about who he is, right? Because if you know this about people, they forget, right? We all have some form of amnesia here or there. And so we tend to forget. Well, repeatedly, God reminds his people, this isn't the first time we're going to see this. I mean, the, the only time. Guess what? Go to Jonah 4.2 now. We're back to Jonah. I hope you put a finger. I should have told you put a finger on Jonah. We're going back. Okay? You didn't know it was Bible drill today, huh? Right before Micah, Jonah 4. Now, we're kind of addressing this on the backside of Jonah. We want to go there because he now reveals why he didn't want to go and the Lord's character. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly. He was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is this not what I said when I was yet in my country? This is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew, here it is, that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Does that sound familiar? Slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Jonah reveals the reason that he does not want to go to Nineveh and preach this good news of repentance. You say, is it good news? Well, yeah, it's good news. If God's going to relent and he is going to save you, that is good news. The reason is, is because he realizes that God is gracious. God is merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He knew that, and he knew that to be true. We see in Jonah chapter 3, verse 2, that Jonah actually preaches uh, 40 days. The message is clarified. 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. God is giving the Ninevites 40 days to repent, and they do. He is being patient once again and showing mercy. Aren't you glad that God gives you more than 40 days? You ever thought about that? Aren't you glad he gave you more than 40 days? <laughs> and that he gives you more than 40 days? But that was his call and his clarification of repentance and the message that Jonah was to bring. Second thing that I want you to write down and realize is our rebellion. Not only does God love all people, but you need to realize we need to look at our rebellion today. Our rebellion. It might be good for some of you just to say that today. I'm a rebel. <laughs> Maybe that's good. Maybe that's just because we are. We're all rebels. We, we are all and all have all rebelled against God. Amen? 
And so it says, but Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. See, so Jonah arises and he goes to buy this ticket from the seaport of Joppa, and he picks the furthest known place that you could pick. Tarshish, we believe, is in modern-day Spain, okay? He's, he's, over, he's over by the Tel Aviv area in, in Israel, over in that kind of area of today, and he's asking for a ticket. He buys a ticket to go all the way over to Spain. Now, none of us do north. Spain is due west. Make sense? From where he's at. So he literally buys a completely opposite direction. And not only that, he spends his own money to go buy this ticket. So he's really invested. I mean, some commentators think that maybe he sold lock, stock, and barrel of wherever he was at, sold his house, sold everything. I mean, fully just went all out so he could go he was going to relocate to Tarshish. So Tarshish is in the exact opposite direction of Nineveh. And this would be the definition of rebellion, wouldn't it be? I'm going to go in the exact opposite direction that you want me to go, God. All of us have a Tarshish. Don't be so quick to dismiss. We all have that place that we have ran to that we think we can get away from the presence of the Lord. We think that we can trick God. We think that we can hide under a stone. We think that we can go to a remote place and that we can get away from what God is telling us to do. Tarshish is the furthest place from the will of God. And my question would be, are some of you living in Tarshish today? I mean, let's not fool ourselves. Some of us may very well be in Tarshish in this moment. Oh, you say, well, I don't live it. You know, Tarshish... Texas, no, but spiritually, emotionally, mentally, you live there. See, you're still trying to fight the love of God. You're still fight, trying to fight his ways. You're still trying to push up against him. You still believe that you can run from him, but you're trying to live in Tarshish. Some of you live in Tarshish so long that you're trying to make it home. But it isn't. And you know something is off. Something is not quite right. Could it be that you are trying to make Tarshish comfortable for you? See, rebellion is willfully breaking fellowship with God. And here's something else we need to know. It will cost you. It will cost you. Our rebellion. We have to acknowledge that, right? Just as I said last week, we have to come to the point where we come to the end of our, ourselves. So, when I think of rebellion, okay, Isaiah, I love you, brother, okay? But I have to tell this story today because it's at two years of old age, you gave me the perfect picture of, of rebellion. Okay, so two years age, I want you to think of two-year-old Isaiah. You all know a two-year-old. Maybe you just walked through this. I don't know, all right? Some of you are going to have some grandbabies that are going to be two years old here in a little bit, and you're going to get to walk through that too. So here we go. I, we were in Corpus, and I remember that Isaiah was in the laundry room, and he, was, he got a puzzle box. And he opened the puzzle box, and he proceeded not to do a puzzle. I mean, he wasn't going to sit there like, you know, hey, let me put this puzzle together and get all the 100 pieces. No, no, no. In fact, it was a preschool puzzle, so it was big pieces anyway. I don't know, 25 pieces, right? And, and he proceeds to do what two-year-old boys probably do. Hey, throw the box up in the air, puzzle pieces everywhere. And so I walk into the laundry room, and I keep it fun and light at the beginning. Okay, let's put these puzzles together. Okay, let's do that. All right? And dad's, dad's getting down there trying to put it together. Trying, okay, let's get it right. And all he wants to do is, hey, let's play with the puzzle pieces. Hey, let's play with the puzzle pieces and throw them up in the air. So he thinks it's just a big party to throw the puzzle pieces in the air. And so, okay, I play along. Okay, right? Let some time go by. I go by. Do, I go do something else. I go work on something else. I come back by. I say, Isaiah, now you know we're going to have to pick these puzzle pieces up. They're going to have to go back into the box. Not even demonstrate. Here, Sally, here's how you do it, right? Just like that. 
And he's like, no, uh-uh. And he shakes his head at me. Mm-mm. I said, no, this is how we do it. No. He proceeds to pull them back out of the box. And so at this point, I'm starting, you know, okay, my, my patience is running a little thin at this point, right? We're, we're now like on an hour in this thing. Like, no, 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 this is how we do it. We're going to put it back in the box, Isaiah, back in the box. And he's like, oh, no, I'm just going to, yeah, all right? And then he leaves the room. He leaves. He leaves the room, and he just goes off to play with something else. And I'm like, no, no. And so I lovingly pick him back up. I bring him back over. I place him down with the puzzles in the laundry room. And do you know what happens after that? Mount St. Helens. And whatever few pieces are in the box, now go out of the box again. Whew. Okay. All right. And then he runs off. He's in, he's in his room. No. We're going to go back in here. Now, at this point, we've got the kicking and screaming going on. So now I'm holding him out like this. Kicking and screaming so he doesn't, doesn't hit me. Right? I put him back down in there. And I say, we're gonna, now we're going to put it back together. And then I get stern. And I say, hey, you will sit here all day in this laundry room until you get the pieces back in the puzzle. It was a full-on battle of the wheels at this point, right? Anybody been there? A few of you. Mark remembers. Okay. All right. And so I, I, this went all afternoon. I'm not kidding you. Four hours. We went through this over and over, over and over. Okay. Okay. All right. And just back and forth. Okay. And I let him go off. Do something. Okay, now it's time. Okay, we're going to go pick up the puzzle now. All right. So anyway, it was probably a teachable experience for me as much for him. Anyway, that's my picture of rebellion. It's like, no. Our Father has told us clearly what he wants. We know his heart. Right? And we know his heart is love for us. Like He, he loves us and he tells these things. Love, but we will fight kicking and screaming And we just won't do it. We just won't do it. That's called rebellion. Now here's the thing. Your rebellion, and you can write this down, is not just your rebellion. You say, what are you talking about? Well, let's go back to our story of Isaiah, right? I love you, brother. I love you. In the Whataburger shirt. I love the Whataburger shirt, too. All right? Um, and so, let's go back to our story of Isaiah. Do you think that that had no effect on the household that afternoon? Do you think that that just stayed isolated to Daddy and Isaiah? No. Daddy was then rough and gruff and short with Hannah, with Micah, with David, with Jody, yeah, confession, good for the soul. Yeah, right? Because my, my, my wires are fried at this point, right? They're, they're just, they're burned, they're fried, right? Daddy should have taken a moment. He didn't take a moment. And I just proceed to just barrel into this thing. That I'm making sure and I'm going to fix his rebellion. But what happens is the whole house gets affected by that rebellion. Listen, your rebellion is not just your rebellion. Jonah gets on this boat, doesn't he? He gets on, he buys this ticket, he gets on this boat that's headed to Tarshish, but what happens? A storm, God sends, it says God sends a storm. The sailors start to, and these are trained sailors. This is what they do. But this storm is so terrifying to them that they figure they got to do something. They start to chunk cargo, which by the way, that's money. You know, that's deliverable goods because they are worried about their lives at this point, not their paycheck. And so they start chunking stuff. Well, that's still not working. They go to, hey, who we got in this boat? What is going on? They go down to the hole. They figure out, oh, yeah, we got, we got this, this, this guy here, um, and, and they don't even know anything about him. This guy just got on the ship. He paid his fare, but they, you know, he went off, did by himself, whatever. And so he doesn't, they, they don't know anything about him. And it says, 
In verse 8, it says, Tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation? And where do you come from? What is your country? And what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. You see, it didn't just affect, his rebellion had effect on the ship. Right? Your rebellion affects those around you. Your rebellion affects your family. Your rebellion affects your workplace. Your rebellion affects those in your circle. And we're naive if we think that it doesn't. But it does. And isn't it interesting also that when we are in our rebellion, we don't like to tell people who we really are and where we're really from. Right? Jonah just wanted to be by himself, just go down there by himself. He, was, he, was, he didn't want to tell anybody. Isn't that right? When we're, when, when we're full long and, and headlong in rebellion, we, we don't really want to talk to people. We, really, we certainly don't want to come to the family of God and, 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 and do that. We, 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 we just want to kind of hide in our rebellion. Aren't you grateful that God does not let us get away with that? When you're on the run from God, you don't want people really knowing who you are, what you really believe. And it occurred to me this week, maybe that's the worst part of rebellion. Maybe the worst part of rebellion is not being known for who you really are. We, we think, the, we, we think the, the worst part of rebellion is maybe the pain that, that what we're receiving, but maybe the worst part of rebellion truly is pretending to be something that we're not really not. I can't tell you how many people who have come to know Jesus and have said, I feel freedom, true freedom, for the first time in my life. Because they could be, they finally came to the point of recognizing the weight of their sin, the depths of his grace and his goodness, and that, that they realized who they really are. They could be honest. How many of you know that the rebellion loves to cover things up? Loves to cover things up. But when we are truly vulnerable, open, and honest with the Lord, that is where healing can take place. That is where there truly can be a reconciliation with the Lord. So your rebellion isn't just your rebellion. Some of you are dealing with rebellion of your children, rebellion of your parents, rebellion of your, of your co-workers. Like you're having to deal with those effects of that rebellion, just like these shipmates were for Jonah. And, and, and we have to realize that that is what is happening and see that for what is happening. But your rebellion isn't just your rebellion. So, <laughs> so what happens? So Jonah confesses and says, well, this is who I really am. I'm a Hebrew. I'm really on the run from the Lord. I'm really like, all this has come upon you because of me. So here's what you need to do. Just throw me out. Well, they don't even want to do that. It's interesting. Is it not <laughs> that the pagan is showing mercy to the one who is supposed to know and understand mercy. The one who does not know the true God is exhibiting greater mercy than the one who knows God. That's a warning for us. Never should this world, this culture, demonstrate greater mercy or understanding of the mercy of God, which they don't even know him, they shouldn't be demonstrating that to a greater extent than the family of Jesus. Because we know the God who is steadfast, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to faith in him. And so... We see that these guys, are they show some mercy here. They don't want to throw them over, but then it comes to a, where they finally have to throw them over, and that's actually how chapter 1 ends. 
chapter 1 ends here. It says that they hurled him into the sea, verse 15, and the sea ceased from raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. And we're not going to concentrate on that part today, but that's how this ends up. They hurled him into the sea. So my, my, my question for you today is, one, do you know the love of God? Do you know the love of God that he is slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love? Or, or is your view of him one of just an, an angry God who just wants to beat people or wants to just kind of just be a killjoy? That's not who God is. God is very clear on his character of who he is. Is it, are you in, are you in rebellion? We were all in rebellion before we came to know Jesus, right? But you can still be, you can still know Jesus, and then, and then you have these moments of rebellion where you say, you know what, today I'm not pursuing the kingdom of Jesus, I'm pursuing the kingdom of Travis, and I'm going to go headlong into that today. Oh yeah, I know, I know Jesus, and I know what he wants, but I'm going to get on the ship to Tarshish, right? You might be in that. And some of you just may not be realizing the effect of that on the people around you. But it hurts. How many of you know that hurt people hurt people? Yeah. And so, so much that we couldn't even get to today, but so much of this story informs us of who God is and who we are of his grace, his mercy, and our rebellion. So much is the gospel story right here in Jonah 1. Let's pray.